Hello, I'm Darlene Flynn, and I'm the director of the Department of Race and Equity for the City of Oakland. And I'm here today in conversation with Dr. Robin D'Angelo, the best-selling author of White Fragility, Why It's So Difficult for White People to Talk About Race. So Robin, tell us something about how you ended up getting into this line of work. Well, it certainly wasn't uh, intentional. I had graduated with a degree in sociology. I was uh, late to academia, so I was in my 30s. I had no idea what I could do with a college degree. I knew I needed to have one. And I was working with a career center at my college, and one day they said, there's a job that just came through, and it's got your name all over it. Uh, and it was for a diversity trainer. And this was the early 90s, and I'd never heard of a diversity trainer, but it sounded so cool, right? You're going to go in the workplace, and you're going to lead conversations on race and racism. And you know, I thought, oh, who doesn't love that kind of thing? And won't that be fun and interesting? And of course, I'm qualified for that because I'm so open-minded. And I applied for the job, and I got the job, and I was in for the most profound learning of my entire life. On basically every level, but the two kind of parallel processes were, first, I was working side by side with people of color, because we did these trainings in interracial teams. And for the first time in my life, my racial worldview was being challenged by people of color. And part of being white is that I could actually have lived that long. You know, I was a parent. Again, I had a college degree and never had my racial worldview been challenged. One, I couldn't even tell you, told you I had a racial worldview. Right? I was raised to just see myself as human. I mean, you have race, but I didn't see that I had race. Right? That's kind of how the world was set up for me. Uh, and so here I was working with people of color who were saying, oh, yeah, you have a race. <laughs> and it, ha it shapes how you think about the world. Uh, and the second challenge was going into the workplace. And it was overwhelmingly white. And these white employees took great umbrage at having to have diversity training. And they were incredibly hostile, incredibly resistant. And I was like a deer in headlights in the face of it. Uh, but years and years of it, right, it, it's so scripted, right, it's so predictable uh, what they're going to say and how they're going to respond that, you know, I, I kind of got enough handle on it over time that I could kind of step back and say, okay, so what's happening here, right? How, how do we pull this off? How do we insist that race has no meaning in a society so deeply separate and unequal by race? And five years of, you know, every day trying to talk to primarily white audiences about race and doing that side by side with people of color. At the end, I just recognized what an extraordinary experience that was, that most white people avoid talking about race, at least in any authentic, direct, honest way. And so I wanted to apply everything I had learned to, to a higher level of education. So uh, unlike a lot of academics, I went from practice to theory. I think a lot of academics go from theory to practice. So I went on to get my PhD. So I had all this kind of research behind what I had actually experienced. And I just began to articulate it uh, in writing and in presentations and started to disseminate it at a much wider level. And that kind of led me to where I am now, which is with this book. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you had a really practical start which grounds your work in a particular way. Yes. So now that you've been doing this work for a while, and after all the research that you did in order to earn your PhD, what are you, th what are you thinking about your work now, looking back on it? Well, um, I, what I wish I had known back then is that uh, all of this abuse is going to uh, pay off, right? And I, mean, I want to be really thoughtful. Um, it doesn't compare to what people of color experience every day. Um, but, you know, white people uh, are, don't take kindly to other white people breaking white solidarity. Uh, and so there was so much hostility all those years, and I wish that I had known, you know what, hang in there. <laughs> uh, it will all come together in a way that you can actually much more effectively challenge that treatment, right? So I guess I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm here now. I just, it might have made those years a little bit easier to know that... Uh, it wasn't for nothing. It was all leading up to something. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that's a good place to bring up your, your latest book, White yeah. Fragility. How, how did that idea or concept come to be? 
You know, I mean, again, years of trying to talk to white people about, about racism just basically wrote that book, right? I mean, it's just me mapping out step by step how we come to be so consistently, those of us who are white, oblivious, and at the same time, uh, arrogant, <laughs> uh, and so certain that we know all we need to know, even as most of us live our lives in segregation, and also how we come to be so resistant to changing that obliviousness. I think for a lot of white progressives, our worst fear is that we would accidentally say something racist. And yet, how do we respond when somebody says, oh, you just said something racist. Wouldn't you want to know that? How dare you? Right. So we're, we're difficult. And I think that's another piece looking back. Um, I do identify as a white progressive. And what I mean by that is, um, and I don't mean Republican versus Democrat, I mean open minded. Right. And I understand the consciousness of open minded white people because I had it. I still struggle with it. Um, I think we can be the most difficult, in fact. Um, because our identities are so attached to and rooted in an idea of open-mindedness um, that we are very, very defensive about finding out anything to the contrary, right? And uh, some things that have changed over the years that I've been doing this work are one, research and implicit bias. I mean, we're pretty clear today that all humans have, you know, implicit or unaware bias that we absorb from the culture at large. We all act on that bias. It doesn't need to be conscious. You know, uh, at the same time that most people, and in this case I'm writing about and to white people, most white people think uh, prejudice, only some people are prejudiced, mm -hmm. um, that they know they're prejudiced, that they mean to be prejudiced, and uh, they intend to hurt other people based on their prejudice. Uh, when in fact most, again, you know, action based on prejudice is not even conscious. That, that doesn't mean the impact is not painful, but I'm at a place where I think intentions are actually fairly irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to know you had good intentions, but what was the impact? Right. That's what matters. We talk a lot about that, yeah. impact versus intent and how useful it is for all of us, but particularly for people with social power, yes. to become much more alert and much more conscious of the impact of their words, their behaviors, their decisions, et cetera. And that's, that's different than the way most of us were socialized to think about ourselves as good people or not good people. Right. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that good-bad binary. I know yeah. you, it's, it's one of the key things that you train from. Yeah, I mean, just to say a little bit more about intent, you know, many of us have gone to workshops and seminars and they have guidelines and often one of them is assume good intentions. And I always say, put a comma next to that and then write, but focus on impact, right? Um, because we tend to believe that as long as our intentions were good, that's really all that matters. But what we're inadvertently saying is since my intentions were good, then the impact shouldn't count and doesn't count. And you need to get over it <laughs> because I've already told you I didn't mean to do it, right? So that, that's a real tricky It's a tight spot. spot. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I use this term, the good-bad binary, to capture this very simplistic and reductionist idea that many of us have, many white people have, but that pretty much circulates through the whole culture as, uh, of what it means to be racist, right? So the mainstream definition is a racist is an individual, is always an individual. What that allows, of course, is, oh, and I'm not that individual, right, who consciously doesn't like people based on race, and is intentionally mean to them. And that definition, uh, I think, is the root of virtually all white defensiveness on this topic. Because if that's what I understand it means to be racist, and you've just suggested that I have inadvertently behaved in a, in a way that has a racist impact on you, what I'm going to hear is you just said I was an intentionally mean person. And that is going to sound like a question to my very moral character. Now I have to defend my moral character. And I mean, white fragility ensues. I think we've, we've all seen that. And so this idea that nice people cannot participate in, be complicit in, or benefit from the racist society that we live in. 
Right, so it becomes mutually exclusive. And you'll notice when somebody uh, is charged with racism, a white person, as part of their defense, which because it must always be defended, <laughs> uh, based on that definition, it's really kind of not possible that the person could have been racist. Part of the defense is to gather all their friends to testify that they're nice people. So therefore, there we go. <laughs> you have to get your references in order at that point. Right, yeah, your references are in <laughs> Just order. Just check yep. with my friends. I'm not racist at all. Yeah, yeah. so that, that kind of good, bad binary is this idea that it's either or. Um, and we have got to change that and just like let it go. It's not either or, it's not good or bad, it's an inevitable result of living in a society in which systemic racism is embedded uh, and that we all absorb its messages. And it's actually really liberating to start from that understanding. I don't struggle with guilt. I'm, I'm really clear that I was socialized with a lot of racial bias and that as a result, I have racist patterns and investments and assumptions and perspectives. I, that's inevitable, right? Um, and I didn't choose any of it. So, you know, guilt is just not useful, but I need to take responsibility for that socialization because it has an impact. Uh, and and when, you, when you change what you understand it means, you actually free yourself from all the having to, fe to defend and deflect and deny and explain and minimize and <laughs> debate and argue. And you can just get to work doing deeply fulfilling uh, search, if you will, of how it's manifesting in your life. Not if. Not if. That reminds me of this question about what can white people do about this. Once they hear you speak, they often, the next place they go as they navigate past their guilt is, okay, so I've got it. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Um, in some ways that what am I supposed to do is the wrong question, right? There, there, there's a little bit of attitude in that, well, supposed to. I mean, it depends on how they're asking. I mean, I, of course there are many white people who are sincerely wanting to understand this. Um, and I, I mean, I would start with know thyself, right? Um, most white people cannot answer the question, what does it mean to be white? How has your race shaped your life? I mean, I've been doing this work for 20 years and very consistently white people have an incredibly difficult time answering that question. But that's not benign, right? There's a collective impact to us not being able to answer that question. Because if I can't tell you what it means to be white, I can't hold what it means not to be white. And I'm not going to be able to validate your experience. In fact, I may need to deny your experience because it reflects something back to me that I'm not prepared to look at. So I would start with oneself and then, um, I mean, I wouldn't wait until you had it figured out because you won't, because <laughs> I certainly don't. But that's kind of step one. And along with that, there's just so much good information out there. It's 2019. There, there's just lists and organizations and read the writing and the work and what and the answer that people of color are have given us to what to do next. You know, it's all it's all out there. It's taking the initiative to to look it up. I mean, we we're in an amazing time where <laughs> it's all you got to do. The information age. Yeah, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Well, that reminds me of another question I had in mind for you, and that is, you often give credit to people like me that you've mm -hmm. worked with over the years, black people that you know in your life for having something to do with how this work has turned out for you and your writing and so on. What have you learned? Mm. Some of what you've learned from the people that you've been. What I have learned is that, like many white people, I was raised not to see any value in relationships with people of color. Mm. Um, that I could go cradle to grave as a white person with few, if any, authentic, sustained cross-racial relationships, and, and with black people in particular. And no one who's loved me or mentored me or taught me has ever conveyed to me that I've lost anything. In fact, white people measure the value of our lives by the absence of people of color. You know, I know what a good school is and I know what a good neighborhood is. And I didn't know I'd lost anything 
until I began to build authentic relationships across race. And my life was set up in a way that that just wouldn't happen. Most white people's lives are set up in a way. Just follow the trajectory laid out for you by your loving parents and family and teachers, and you will probably live a segregated life. And I'm not sure it would have happened if I hadn't taken a job where I was working side by side with people of color who were not just challenging the way I saw the world, but challenging the message that they, have, I don't know how to say this, held up, who were not just challenging the way that I saw the world, but showing me their humanity. I mean, that just sounds heartbreaking for me to say, but I wasn't raised to see the humanity of people of color because we live so separate, right? And we depend on such narrow and repetitive representations. And it also motivated me, like seeing, you know, I could talk about how I was treated in the early days as I stood in front of these rooms that were 100% filled with employed white people, bitterly complaining that because of affirmative action, white people can't get jobs anymore. And, and it, there's a kind of, I mean, it's, del, it's delusional. Uh, and it's, it's kind of terrifying in, the, in its delusion because the, the anger was real. I mean, what they're complaining about is not actually happening in, in, in any reality, but their rage about it was real. And I know what that was like for me to, to receive that. But imagine, and I probably, you don't have to imagine, what it was like for the, the person of color standing by my side to receive it. It didn't trigger a history of terror for me. It didn't hit, trigger a history of irrational group of white people upset about race, right? And I would drive home with those co-trainers and I would see the pain. And not only did that develop my understanding of their humanity, but it gave me the motivation when I felt intimidated to just see your face, <laughs> see your pain, see your heartbreak and say, no, not on my watch. You know, um, it's th those are not small things. I could give you an intellectual analysis, but I think of what I learned from people of color, but I think that heart analysis is what's giving me the courage. It does take a lot of courage to break rank yeah. and to stand up in front of rooms of angry people yep. um, and to recognize that even as you do that, you have a different location that you're coming from that actually makes it easier for you yes. than it might be for your, your co-trainer, yeah. who is a, is a black woman in my case. And I think there was something in the, the years that we got to train together that also relieved me of having to address directly to people who weren't really interested in hearing it from me some yeah. analysis about what was going on in those dynamics, which then gave me as a person of color space to lead as a woman of color um, without as much attention yeah. being used, much, as much psychic you know, yeah. bandwidth being absorbed by this other energy. Right that needed to be dealt with and, and was worthy of exploration, but to be able to do it in partnership with someone who was so clear and so committed hmm. to, to making that a more doable task and yeah. more, a more usable space was pretty profound for me, particularly as a new trainer back then yeah. in the early days yeah. when we were in some ways both figuring out a lot of things about how to do this work well yeah. and to produce new and better outcomes as a result of it. So um, I just, as you were talking, I, I remembered those moments. I had yeah. several of them flash through my mind right. and wanted to, wanted to acknowledge that while you were learning from us, you were also creating an environment that was less hostile for mm -hmm. us by um, enabling uh, white people to be able to work with you, yeah. you know, by being there and being clear and so. Yeah, you know, there, there's, it's so complex and so layered, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand, particularly now when most of my leading is by myself because I have this book and I'll come and give a book talk um, and I'll stand in front of a room full of people, you know, with the microphone, like basically every other role model, teacher, authority figure that white people have, and that that is centering whiteness, right? Um, that's an inherent part of the work. And to use that platform to challenge whiteness is, is to decenter it in an interesting way, right? Because it remains so uh, centered by never being uh, acknowledged. Um, Centered, and, but not named. Yes, 
Yeah, and just years of also your brilliance, right, and the brilliance of, of countless people of color, you know, testifying, holding me accountable, right? Yes. Um, and, and I often think, I, I don't think I have any less racist patterns than any other white person. I'm clear at this point, I, I do way less harm than I used to. Uh, I'm not defensive at all when I step in it, and I have very good repair skills, right? But I think one of the reasons you haven't given up on me and other people I've worked with haven't given up on me is how I responded to that feedback. And that's something I really want white listeners to understand, right? Um, is that I don't think people of color expect us not to have the, this socialization and they don't expect it to not come out at times, but the key is in those moments when it surfaces, where can you go with us? And if you can't go there with us, if the first time you ever call me in on anything, I withdraw or burst into tears or, right, um, you're probably not gonna do it again. And I'm gonna think we have, everything's fine and we're not actually gonna have an authentic relationship. So I think the difference is how I responded to the feedback. I took it in, I sat with it, and I tried to do different. Good advice. Good advice. So while we're on on this, uh, this um, you're you have you're white. You you easily point that out when you're doing <laughs> yep. training, and and I'm black. And one of the interesting things about this latest book was that you included a chapter on anti-black racism, yes. which is something, of course, that black people have written about exhaustively. Yeah. And uh, it, but I don't know if I've ever picked up a book by a white author who directly challenged anti-black racism. You want to talk about that a little bit, especially here in Oakland, yeah. where we have a large black population and a very large activist history around yeah. black um, civil rights. For me, that was the bravest chapter, to be honest, um, because when you put yourself in front of people on this topic, as you know, you get lots of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, almost everything out of my mouth has just been years and years and years of feedback, right? And uh, I used to get a lot of feedback about, oh, you're making this black and white, right? And, you know, you're leaving out other people of color. And so I used to just try to be so careful about that. And I finally got to a point where I'm going to tell you as a white person, it's black and white. <laughs> that that does not mean other groups of, of color don't experience racism because I'm clear all people who are not perceived or defined as white experience racism. And they experience it in shared ways, but also in ways that are specific to their group. And part of me coming to what I think of as racial literacy has been to understand not just the general, but the particular. I, I have a very different um, stereotypes, responses to uh, people from different racial groups. And having said that, I think in the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other. And we have the most energy, and there are these bookends. And white is on one end and black is on the other. And where your position in relation to those two ends, that shapes how you experience your racialization, right? Uh, and anti-blackness, actually, I, I know you understand, cuts across all those groups sometimes called colorism. So the darker you are within any group, you know, the more compounded is the oppression. And I wanted to talk about it uh, um, and just, just risk having, you know, some people's feathers be ruffled, but I just, I just have to repeat, it doesn't mean other people of color don't experience racism. Um, but for white people, nothing seems to turn that crank of white resentment like thinking black people got something over on us mm -hmm. that they didn't inherently deserve. And the subtext is they're inherently deserving, undeserving. And Carol Anderson writes about that beautifully in her national award-winning book, um, in her national book award uh, book, White Rage, where she argues every inch of black advancement has been met by a wave of white rage. And, and I think actually we see that vividly right now, post-Obama. Yes. I think we would agree <laughs> on that one. So just we'll just keep going down that road, because there are many dilemmas for you in doing this work. So the civil rights activist Audre Lorde said, for the master's tools, will never dismantle 
the master's house. So how do you, as a, as a white trainer, writer, navigate or think about that profoundly deep observation? Yeah, and, and I'll, I will paraphrase her, but she goes on to say, the true locus of revolutionary change are never the oppressive situations we seek to avoid, but that part of the oppressor uh, planted deep within ourselves, who knows his tactic and his ways. And so, as, as I acknowledged earlier, I am centering whiteness in my work, uh, and it, it is a both end. I mean, the, we're in it, we're in the master's house, right? There's no free space, there's no way out of that. Um, and I know I'm also challenging it, right? And. Um, the piece about the oppressor deep within us, you know, I spent, I grew up in poverty. You know, I, I'm a proudly angry feminist. <laughs> and I spent years thinking about the injustices of patriarchy and sexism and classism. Uh, but never until I took that job in my 30s had I ever considered how I not only benefited from somebody else's oppression, but participated in it. Right, And so I think the key is, how do I use those other experiences as a way in rather than a way out? So many white people who experience oppression in some other way then just don't want to engage around racial privilege and, you know, I'm a minority too kind of thing. Um, I use it as a way in when I can't figure out a piece of racism. I kind of, I just change the roles <laughs> in my head and then I, I can see it really clearly. And um, I, I'm also very clear it's not the same, but it's a, it's a potential way to understand uh, where you are benefiting and complicit because you, you know what it's like to be on the other side of that, right? Um, it's certainly illustrative of how systemic oppression works, yeah, yeah. how systemic these isms are. And I actually think um, centering race for me as a white person has been a phenomenal way to address not just my internalized superiority, and I'm just gonna be really clear, all white people who grow up in a Western-oriented or white colonial settler society have internalized superiority. <laughs> uh, it, there's gonna be white people hearing that right there that don't, don't wanna look at that, uh, but the research is very clear by age three to four. All children know it's better to be white. Those messages are circulating 24 seven, right? So how, um, but so, so to center race doesn't actually deny where I have experienced less, right? It's helped me challenge the messages of internalized inferiority, right? So for example, I might not feel as smart as other people because I grew up poor, right? I shouldn't say I might not. I don't often <laughs> feel as smart as other people, but I also recognize that's, that's a lie. You know, it's not true that I'm not as smart as other people just because I grew up poor. But when that is running inside me, it keeps me quiet. Well, what if I recognize racism going on right now, but I, I don't trust my own thinking and so I'm silent about it? Well, it, I'm, I'm feeling inferior, not superior. That's why I'm silent. But how is it functioning? It's functioning to support the racism that's going on. Right? And so when I recognized that, I realized, well, you know, when you speak up about it, you're not just challenging racism, you're healing the lie that you're not as smart as other people, because that is a lie, right? That's, that's uh, someone who grew up as poor version of <laughs> oppression. Um, and so it's this beautiful kind of simultaneous healing where we've internalized a message of less and then using our advantage position to challenge where we experience more. Sometimes as people of color, we talk about our own agency in areas where we have, where we have some social privilege. Yes. Uh, myself as a straight, cisgendered woman yep. um, can practice my agency, challenge my internalized oppression as a woman of color by tapping into my agency in an area where I have some social advantage. And it does pull you out of, yes. for a moment, some of the victimization that can cause us to go inactive in ways that aren't necessarily useful for us, for, my, for me as a woman of color, to yeah. be you know, subservient in some way because of my internalized oppression. So this ability to change 
um, to change channels and to use that as a place to both heal and stand up for. Yeah, nicely or stand said. Up against <laughs> injustice is very. It's it's very practical. Yeah. I like that, for, I mean, change channels. I think about it as saliency, right? In certain contexts, different kind of identities or positionalities are more or less salient. So how do I use them, you know, based on my best read of the environment, always towards a more just society, right? A more just room, a more just meeting, a more just workplace, right? So I'm often asked, because I do a lot of capacity building and training, what should I be reading? What's, what's out there that is interesting and good and that would help me to recalibrate how I think about race and racism? And I have my favorites, they, you know, they float. My, my, favorite, my top favorite right now is Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Yep. Kendi. Yep. And um, it's just, I'm recommending it to everyone. My partner's reading it right now. Um, what do you recommend to people? Because I do think there's a lot of self-education that people can do by taking in some of the amazing research and writing that's going on. Absolutely. Um, well, I had one thought would be, I mean, there's a difference between what I would recommend to white folks and what I would recommend, but, uh, but to uh, probably to black folks, I'd say, read uh, What Doesn't Kill You Will Make You Blacker. <laughs> I saw that on your coffee table. It I got it on mine, too. just to me as a gift. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think both, uh, absolutely, Ibram Kendi's book. Uh, Carol Anderson, not just White Rage, but she has a book called um, One Person, No Vote. And it's a pretty exhaustive kind of examination of voter suppression. I mean, we have to understand, um, we have to have a structural understanding for what's happening uh, in society for the consistently racially inequitable outcomes. Because if we don't have a structural understanding, we're left with profoundly problematic explanations for current conditions. And those are explanations almost always that blame the victim, right? Uh, Ijeoma Oluo's So You Want to Talk About Race? Uh, um, Rennie Edo Lodge, Why I'm Not Talking to White People About Racism Anymore. <laughs> oh, that's a new oh, yeah. title. I like yeah. that one. Charles Wright Mills, also an award-winning book, uh, The Racial Contract. That's, that was uh, one of the most powerful books that I've ever read on the topic. For Teachers, The White Woman's Guide to Teaching Black Boys is just uh, just thick with really great articles. In fact, I have one in there called White Teacher Know Yourself. So it's kind and that's of, by Eddie Moore, it, Eddie, Eddie Moore, Moore Jr. And, um, mm -hmm. A couple other folks. Yeah. Um, Crystal Meyer, How to Be Less Stupid About Race. <laughs> it's a great title. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a great title. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that one of the reasons that I refer people to some of this amazing writing that's going on is to save myself, you know, some work. Yes. Right, people can self-educate, and we can f we can begin to turn our our assumptions about what's going on that creates these racial disparities that we're very concerned about in the city of Oakland that are actually the product of um, anti-black racism in many ways because the most extreme impacts are being borne by our black residents here in Oakland, of, uh, not alone, but to a, a shocking extreme in some cases. So. How do you keep yourself charged up for this? I know that certainly I have to have strategies around that, and I know other um, white people who are working for justice in society who can get pretty stressed out doing this work. What keeps you hopeful? What keeps you going? How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, I actually have found nothing more intellectually, psychically, emotionally, spiritually stimulating and rewarding than this work. And yes, it is painful at times, but I don't really believe there's much point to being alive if I'm not growing and challenging and some way contributing. And this, this path, I mean, when white people wanna know what to do, honestly, talk about racism with other white people. Uh, break with white solidarity, break with silence. It's really hard to do and it takes courage. Uh, the rewards, what keeps me going? Well, beautiful relationships with people like you that, you know, that I would not have had if I hadn't done this work, right? Uh, I certainly need to have my own support team, right? People that I talk to, both white people and people of color to kind of check out my thinking and to be accountable. I, I always wanna offer a question to white people that are so sure it's not them, which is just, how do you know? 
right? Like, why are you so sure it's not you? Uh, when's the last time you had a conversation uh, with a person of color in your life, if there are any people of color in your life? Uh, and if there aren't, how could you be so sure it's not you? But if you have people of color in your life, and in my experience, black people in particular, and you're not talking about racism, the relationship's probably not as authentic as you think it is. And probably somewhere you conveyed that you couldn't hear it and you weren't open to it, right? But, but those kinds of relationships are just profoundly rewarding. Within the last year, Oakland became, went national, um, not the first time, but this time it was about a white woman's tears. It was about barbecue Becky. And I know that that sparked conversations far and wide. So could you talk a little bit about your perspective on that phenomenon? Sure, and, and the first thing I always wanna say um, is to just caution white listeners from this kind of barbecue Becky is the, is the racist and I'm not, right? Mm. And, and we, we go there so easily. I'm pretty sure barbecue Becky, sorry, for lack of a better term for her, would insist that she's not racist, right? Um, so I, the first thing I would wanna say is these incidences are not new in any way. Um, the only thing that's different is we can now record them and you can prove that that happens to you because it's been happening forever and we have said, no, it doesn't happen to you because it doesn't happen to me, right? So now we can actually say, oh, here it is, right? So, so that's important, right? The other piece is a kind of um, entitlement to space, right? So this is my space um, and you don't belong here right? And you will defer to me, right? I mean, you will step off the curb when I come down to use kind of a Jim Crow era analogy, right? There's a kind of uppityness to you being in my space. I mean, I don't think any of this has to be conscious, but there's such a deep sense of, of white as an ideal, right? The whiter the space, the more ideal the space, right? The better the school, the better the neighborhood. And then because we live so separate, this just deep association with danger and crime. Now, whiteness is a perversion <laughs> of reality in a sense. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the things that white, the white collective does is project all of our sins, if you will, onto the black body, right? I think that the white collective needs black people, right? There's no superiority without inferiority, right? And so there's this really kind of, I don't know if it, symbiotic is the word, but there's this relationship, right? And so you, you need to exist, but you need to be in your place. And actually, I don't really care what happens to you to keep you in your place, as long as you're not in my place and my equity remains high. And in some ways, what we're seeing is people videoing, uh, this is what they've been doing to keep us in our place. And now there's a crisis of conscience, right? It's been, it's been made visible. So you can see there's lots of layers here that I, that I see. Um, yeah, I think there was a kind of umbrage to, no, you don't belong here. And then uh, when the response wasn't the way she wanted it to be, and she had absolutely no capacity to, to handle that. And so it just falls apart also. Again, I don't think any of this has to be conscious, um, but this is certainly how it functioned. Well, I'm a white female. If I fall apart, all of the resources will come back to me. That's usually how that happens. And so suddenly she's the victim and you're the aggressor, right? Uh, well, that didn't happen. So you've got a lot of meltdowns going on for somebody like that. It's, it's, if you have the patience to watch the whole video, you can see that very process yes. unfolding. Like a kind of shock. Yeah. 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 D didn't expect it to go that way. No. Not at all. Yeah. Which and then like you. a temper tantrum in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which shows you just a reflection of how behavior flows from socialization. Yes. Now you are set up with a certain expectation about how the world is supposed to react to you and to your concerns. And, and when it doesn't go that way, it's, it, it's very... It's very, uh, it's a very big event. It's a very big event. So, um, thank you.
Thank you. I, I know lots of listeners will will be glad that you spoke to that. It has actually um, been a topic here in Oakland too, and I think it has caused um, the black community particularly to to come back to that area. It, it was an area that was once very, very black p part of the city, but isn't anymore. And so I now notice, because I live fairly close to Lake Merritt, that when I'm down there, um, the population of people enjoying the space is shifting. Yeah. So it can also create an opening um, for um, people to activate space in a more multicultural and inclusive way and with a sense of, of we, we belong. This is our space, yeah. this is our town. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be like that. And right. I, I think, I haven't been here long, so I don't know what it was like before, but I know that there's a deep sense of loss um, from the, the loss of black population in Oakland. And then when you have these moments to punctuate that, yeah. it's, it's really um, eye-opening and activating. And it's actually a good thing. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's kind of a um, it's got to be like a how dare you, right? Like uh, we wanted this back, so that I can I can only imagine the impact of, uh, for Oakland from where I grew up in San Jose, actually, and so Oakland was just what you avoided Oakland, right? It, it was it it had this reputation, right? Until of course we want it back, <laughs> yes, and then now it's ours again, and you, you don't belong here. I do want to caution. Any white woman listening, right, and thinking that they're not a Becky, right, uh, that they would never call the police, and probably you wouldn't ever call the police, but I would like to ask you what maybe version of that you've done in your own workplace around uh, the advancement uh, of people of color or the ways in which people of color in the workplace get undermined. And it, it all seems what we call perfectly logical explanations that consistently result uh, in people of color being uh, suppressed in the workplace, right? So th this is the question, what's my version of that? Right, that's not me, but I know I have contributed to the undermining of co-workers in, in other kinds of ways. And Perhaps more subtle, but absolutely. just as meaningful. Well, may I ask you, as someone who's been in the workplace, have you had any white women who would swear they would never call the police on somebody in the barbecue area still undermine you every step of the way? This does happen. Okay. <laughs> yes, it does, and mostly unconsciously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanna thank you so much this has been a great conversation. I hope that the viewers enjoyed as much as I have. Obviously, we know each other very, very yeah. well, so it's fun to be doing it this way instead yeah. of the way we usually do it. And I just uh, wanna express my gratitude that you're here in Oakland you're, and, and talking to me today. It's always been an honor to lead by your side, so thank you. Thank you.